Hello, everyone, and good morning. Welcome to the 2020 Women in Clean Energy Conference. We're so excited to have you here with us today. So my name is Sophia Palmer, and I'm a fifth year senior at the University of Dayton, studying mechanical engineering with a minor in sustainability, energy, and the environment. The reason I'm here today is because I've had the privilege to work with some amazing men and women to organize and facilitate this conference this year and to transition it to an all virtual event. It's no secret that women tend to be unrepresented across the energy field. And this conference was founded on the idea to encourage women to the table, not only in the clean energy industry, but in the fight against climate change. We're going to provide resources, knowledge, and connections necessary to build impactful careers in the clean energy field. So we encourage you to not only listen to our keynote speaker here today, but to ask questions, be curious, and follow up. We invite all attendees to submit questions through the Q&A or chat box feature during the session and questions will be addressed at the conclusion of the presentation. If you have any further questions following the event, we will be providing contact information for our keynote speaker, as well as all of our amazing panelists that we had previously this week. As we move forward, I would also like to let you know that today's session will be recorded and the recording will be posted to our website. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for the 2020 Women in Clean Energy Conference, Susan Brennan. Susan is the Executive Vice President and COO of Bloom Energy. Just a little bit of background on Susan is that she completed her Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from the University of Illinois, CU, and her Master of Business Administration from the University of Nebraska. Susan has more than 30 years of manufacturing experience, including energy, automotive vehicle, powertrain, and components assembly. Susan has dedicated her career to improving American manufacturing and assuring that the United States maintains a vital manufacturing footprint, especially in areas of key technological advances. In her time as a manufacturer, manufacturing practitioner. She has always been a strong proponent of sustainability, starting in her first role at the environmental and coding manager with Douglas and Lomson, leading to the plant, to, leading the plant to Iowa's first waste minimization award to launching the all electric Nissan Leaf in Simra, Tennessee, and now the COO of Bloom Energy in Sun, Sunnyvale, California bringing reliable, always-on energy to critical infrastructure, including data centers, hospitals, grocery stores, banks, and other essential services. Throughout her career, Susan has maintained that jobs and the environment have a symbiotic relationship and that passion drives her as she pursues her role at Bloom. In addition, she has created and supported organizations that encourage young women to pursue careers in math and science as a way to support future generations of technological manufacturing in the United States. Susan founded the Southern Automotive Women's Forum, a 10-year-old 501c3 whose mission is to provide professional development for women in the automotive industry and scholarships and has changed the face of automotive leadership in the southeastern United States. Susan is now an ambassador for C3E, a Department of Energy program that tasked with bringing more women into the energy and for professional development of women currently in the energy field. Both of these organizations support Susan's passion of building and growing technical fields to be more open and accessible for highly talented and skilled women. Susan shared her story of her career with her alma mater, the University of Illinois, giving the molecular and cellular biology commencement speech in 2019 to tell her story of how a technical degree can lead to a rewarding and exciting path for those who are willing to take on the challenge. Please join me in welcoming Susan Brennan. Well, thank you, Sophia. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction. Um, it's, uh, it's been it's been a journey, and I want to I want to before I start talking about my career and and uh, and Bloom. I think all of you on this who are on, in this uh, session today, you really need to be grateful and thankful for people like Sophia and the people who put these programs together. Um, as Sophia said, I founded Southern Automotive Women's Forum, which is a five hundred one c three that really works off sweat equity, and I know how hard putting together events is and, and the time and energy. So one, I'm grateful to the, to the founders of this event uh, to, to offer me a chance to talk about my career, but uh, for all of you online, you, sh you should uh, also uh, send a note of thanks. And it's one thing to 
participate, it's a whole nother thing to put something like this together. So just wanna send out that, uh, those thoughts before I get started. So really to, to get value out of today, how, how I see this is I'll go through my, my career journey. You heard a lot of it in the introduction and I'll flush a little bit of it out. Talk about Bloom, but I really see the richness in these, in these, these events in, in the conversation and, and in the questions you have and in the, um, you know, in, in the journey that you're gonna be on. And if I don't, if you don't hear anything else today or don't take away anything else today, I, I, I wanna leave you just with, with two points. The, your career is a journey. The outcomes of what you do and where you are today as you're in your, your university studies are, a, to me, they're a foundation of skills that you then build on. So get all the skills that you can that you think are important and then you will find that's a, a, a great base platform, but it is a journey and you have no idea where you're gonna be. And, and in many ways, I envy your generation versus my generation. So I came from the generation when women could be secretaries, nurses, and teachers. I clearly didn't take that path and, and, and took the alternative route, but the world was much more, there, there were so many more boundaries. And it's good and bad to have lack of boundaries. Maybe there's too many choices in your generation. But, but again, if, if I don't leave you with anything else, it's, it's that get the skills, do the, do the tactical building of skills, but make sure you're open to the journey. If I had not made decisions along the way to take paths that were non-traditional, or paths that I didn't even, couldn't have even fathomed. Um, I wouldn't be where I am today. So with that, if we can go to the next slide. All right, am I controlling the, okay, there we go. All right, so then the, the questions that I have for you, uh, Jen, am I driving this or are you? You should be able to, um, otherwise I can if that's best. Let me try this again. Yeah, life is a, everything is a journey. Even when you practice, things don't work as you plan. Okay, yeah, for some reason it's not letting me move forward. All right, if you can just do this whole slide, just do it, it's a build slide, but just go ahead and, and, and put all the questions out there. So, okay. If, yeah, so, so these are questions that I have for you um, really to think about as we go through this, this conversation. You know, are you excited or are you nervous about your career prospects? Do you think you need to know exactly what you want to do as you sit here today? And I find it interesting, maybe because of my own personality and my own journey. I've spoken to hundreds of, of young women and and they feel like if they don't know exactly what they want to do today, that um, that somehow that you know that, that that amount of stress that they put on themselves that that uh, that, that they're not going to be successful. And and if you follow my career, you'll see that that's not uh, that hasn't that hasn't rung true for me. And then I think it's really important. Do you want to change the world? Do you want to travel? Do you want to make a lot of money? Do you want to do all of the above? You want to do a few of the above, as as Sophie said in the in, in the opening. You know that, that women aren't heavily represented in energy, um, and uh, that's something I, I see changing. But but something that needs to you know th that is an opportunity. But these are all things you can do in, in a career in energy. You can change the world. You can travel the world. You can make a lot of money, or you can do a subset of them all. But you know, think about why is it you want a career in energy? And they don't, you can do all of the above, you can, you can prioritize. Um, I am gonna try one more time to take over the screen here. Let's see if I can do this. Um, all right, yeah, Jen, it won't let me, it won't let me move. Okay, wait a second, maybe it will. Nope, <laughs> I, can't, I can't move the slides. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. Okay, yeah, just go ahead and build this slide too. So, so this, this is another slide that's just another way of framing uh, visually the questions that, that I ask myself and the questions that I, that I ask audiences when I talk about you know, my career and how it applies to their career. 
you know, do you have a jet destination and a goal? Um, yeah, Jen, if you can just go ahead, yeah, go ahead and build the whole thing out. So, so these are just questions to ask yourself. And the question I'm asking myself is why did I use build slides for a virtual event? So I'm learning the hard way not to do that. So if you can keep going. So just, just another way of framing, you know, what, what is, you know, what are, what are you trying to do? I think it's more important to look at the, the, the motivation versus the destination. So just think through some of these, these concepts as, as you think about your career. And then, then I'll, if we can go to the next slide, I'll explain my career. Okay, yeah, go ahead if you want to just build the whole slide. So, so how did I end up here? Um, it is, you know, everybody starts somewhere. <clears throat> and I know I'm speaking to a Midwestern university, so I don't know where the people who are watching this have come from. If you're primarily from the Midwest or uh, you're, if you're from other parts of the, of the country or other parts of the world. But I wanted, you know, to, when I was very small, I wanted to save the world. Um, so that's been, you know, been my, my lifelong ambition. I, I really wanted to be a genetic engineer. My dad died at 29 when I was five of a congenital heart disease. And his father had died young. And so there was a, a family history of, of, the, of, of death of immediate family members. And I was really good at science. And so I thought, well, this is a way for me to address the, the challenges that I've lived through and maybe help people avoid having to live through them themselves. I never wanted to work in manufacturing. So the, the, the two pictures at the bottom, I'm from Granite City, Illinois, a place I'm very proud of being from and a community that, I, that I'm very endeared to, uh, provided me a very good education very good opportunities and people, you know, really hardworking people provided the taxes to provide the public schools that moved me forward. And I went through school, went through University of Illinois on grants and loans and work. So I, uh, I, I definitely did not have the means to put myself through college. And I wanted to travel the world. When you grow up and you don't have a lot of money, and I grew up right across the river from St. Louis, my my vacations were going to the St. Louis Zoo because it was free. So, um, which then opened me up to a, to a whole, nother, whole nother world. And I'll always be indebted to Anheuser-Busch for keeping the, the zoo free when I was young so that it, it gave me a place to go to. And they also, they also uh, endowed the Science Center. So St. Louis was a great city to go to learn. And, and because all of these, these you know, these, um, these museums, they were all free. So um, that was my that was that was my foundation, right? I I had seen, I knew I was good at science. I had seen a way to help others with my with my gift for science. Um, the air where I grew up smelled terrible, and the particulate matter was you know was not great. Um, but uh, but it gave me a good foundation, and and you know I brought the work ethic from my community. So next slide. Okay, so what really happened? So I spent five years doing research. I left University of Illinois, went down to Texas. I worked for MD Anderson Hospital and Herc Selenese and worked for Monsanto um, out of college and found that it really was not consistent with who I am. I am not good at standing in a lab uh, by myself for eight hours and doing the same experiment over and over and over and changing a variable at one at a time. Um, and and it, I didn't think it was going to get me to really what I wanted to do, which was, which was doing cutting edge research on, on healthcare. Okay, next slide. Next. Yeah, so then I spent 25 years building cars and car parts. Absolutely inconsistent with everything I wanted to do, everything I wanted to to be, um, but the, one of the most exciting careers I could have ever had 
And that's where the, the waste minimization award occurred and then bringing the Nissan leave. So even though it seems like it was inconsistent um, with my mission in, in many ways I have been able to do it. I definitely traveled the world and I believe that I've been a, a big part of changing the world and bringing electric vehicles, you know, commercializing really complex technology. Next slide, our next comment. So as I said, I have traveled the world um, and then uh, if you keep going and then uh, you can see the that I'm now working for a startup in the distributed energy sector. So that's me in my Nissan uniform um, on the uh, on the final line of a car plant. So um, probably should have one here with a leaf. Just real, just thought about that. But uh, really, really exciting time in all kinds of sectors. And energy and automotive are really uh, over, you know, crossing over right now. And then you can see in the back, those are the bloom boxes. So that's that's the picture right outside the factory that I run in Sunnyvale, California. So really exciting company, amazing technology. Uh, and we'll talk more about that when we get to Bloom. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I put my journey kind of in a, in a timeline. This gets back to kind of the opening. Do you have to know what you wanna do? Do you, you know, do, do you know where you wanna be? So you can see after I did research, then I went to, um, my first job in Iowa for an automotive supplier. And that was actually really exciting. And I used a lot of science. The, uh, I was the environmental and coatings manager, had never wanted to be in a factory, ended up in a factory using my, using my skills to build capability in the factory. Uh, the factory is actually gonna be shut down. They were violating the wastewater treatment permit. They didn't have anybody that could help them and uh, I was able to work with the entire team there using the technical skills that I had, even though I had no manufacturing experience. And uh, we went from the plant almost being shut down to ending up to win. Uh, what today you know is ESG or sustainability used to be called ecology. I took that in fourth grade and then uh, used to be called waste minimization. So why don't you go ahead and just, Jen, just build this whole slide. Okay, yeah, then I, became a plant manager at 29. Um, and then I joined Ford Motor Company and ran factories there and built their global business office. Uh, and then I joined Nissan uh, and ran the largest automotive assembly plant under one roof in the world and brought the Nissan Leaf. And now I am at an energy company. So it's been a journey. Okay, next slide. Okay, so let's, let's talk about Bloom. So this is our mission statement, to make clean, reliable energy affordable for everyone in the world. Okay, next slide. So why, why am I so proud of working at Bloom and so proud of the technology? This is the world you live in. So you can see Los Angeles air quality pre-COVID and uh, post-COVID. Now, the downside was that this was from you know, shutting down commerce. You know, people couldn't move, people were locked in, everything stopped. And, and growing up, that's what, that's, that's what the community I, I lived in looked like. The air quality was like that in, in, in the, you know, what you see in Los Angeles. So one of the reasons I came to Bloom is Bloom is not just distributed so that you can move the energy next to the, the, whatever it is you want to run, but there's no combustion. There's no NOx, there's no SOx, there's no particulates. So why I, why I am so passionate about what I do is we can reopen the economy and have the air stay like Los Angeles if we think differently and if we really use technology and if really smart people like you who are participating in this program dig in and, and, and do the work. Next slide. So, you know, these, these are not anything earth shattering. But I mean, they, they, are the, they are the truth. I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up with power outages. Every time the Mississippi River flooded or there was a tornado or an ice storm, we lost power. That was my reality growing up. It wasn't a lot of people's reality in the US. And particularly I find out here in the Bay Area that most people, they're, they're, not, they're not used to power outages. So, so what used to happen is now happening more frequently and what used to happen more of a localized area 
is now happening happening globally. And what is happening globally is, is happening even at more intensity and speed. So um, these are all really hard problems to solve that are gonna take really strong women and men to, to dig in and solve and, and continue to dig in and solve. Okay, next slide. So distributed generation to try to frame, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, you know, computing, computers used to be the size of houses and now they're sitting literally on my desk and your desk, you know, telephones are on the wall. You had one in the house. If you were from a really wealthy family, you had two. Now everybody has at least four or five phones in their house and, and they're portable and, and not attached to the wall. And it's the same way here with energy. Energy has been set up for a, for a centralized and transmission infrastructure. And now with today's technology, not just Bloom, microgrids, solar, wind, all kinds of different, different technologies, that the source of energy can be right next to where the user is. And, and that is a huge breakthrough. Next slide. Okay, how Bloom works. So this is a video that'll take a minute, um, but, but I think it's a, it's a good video to help explain some of the, the technical aspects of Bloom. As the demand for reliable clean electricity grows, we're faced with challenges such as an aging grid infrastructure, natural disasters, and rising electricity costs. Bloom's energy servers convert fuel into electricity through an electrochemical process without combustion at the highest efficiency of any power solution available in the world today. Designed for modularity, similar to a building block, any number of our systems can be clustered together in various configurations to form solutions from hundreds of kilowatts to tens of megawatts. Solid oxide fuel cells consist of three parts, an electrolyte, an anode electrode, and a cathode electrode. An electrolyte is what the electrical ions move through in a fuel cell. For a solid oxide fuel cell, the electrolyte is a solid ceramic material. The anode and cathode are made from special inks that coat the electrolyte. Unlike other types of fuel cells, no precious metals, corrosive acids, or molten materials are required. Next, an electrochemical reaction converts fuel and air into electricity without combustion. Operating at high temperature, warmed air enters the cathode side of the fuel cell. Meanwhile, steam mixes with fuel, entering the anode side to produce reformed fuel. As the reformed fuel crosses the anode, it attracts oxygen ions from the cathode. The oxygen ions combine with the reformed fuel to produce electricity, water, and small amounts of carbon dioxide. The water gets recycled to produce the steam needed to reform the fuel. The process also generates the heat required to keep the fuel cell warm and drive the reforming reaction process. So long as fuel and air are added, the process continues producing clean, reliable, affordable energy. Our energy server is a stationary power generation platform built for the digital age and capable of delivering highly reliable, uninterrupted, 24-7, always-on power that is also clean and sustainable. Among the most efficient energy generators on the planet, our platform dramatically reduces electricity costs and greenhouse gas emissions. Some of the largest companies in the world trust Bloom Energy to provide their businesses with clean, reliable, and resilient energy. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so, so you, you can read this, I, I won't go through this, but, but what I love about working at Bloom is that, as you just saw in that video, it's really hardcore science, math, physics, material science, electrical engineering, chemical engineering. It, it, it's real, it's, it's the real deal. So there are many jobs out there where you can be part of, a, you know, part of a large company. And I was part of two very large companies. 
Um, so I'm going to put a plug in for, for manufacturing and supply chain and, and engineering. Uh, but, but a company that makes something, that makes something like Bloom, from a career perspective and from a job satisfaction perspective, is, is really exciting. And, and I, I think as you think about your skills, again, you know, what are the skills that you bring? Do you bring science? Do you bring math? Do you bring physics? Do you bring chemical engineering? Do you bring material science? And then do you bring the ability to work as part of a team? And then do you build, bring the ability to pull it all together as part of a business? Everybody can't be good at everything. For someone like me, you have to be good at the science and math. You have to be good at the collaboration. You have to be good at the business. But if you're just really, really good at the science and math, there are some big, big, big problems out there that need to be solved. And I, I would challenge you to think about how do you take what you're really good at and apply, and apply that to, to solving these problems. So this is, this is how I've chosen to take the skills I have and the experience I have, is to solve this really, really challenging problem of distributed, reliable, clean energy. Next slide, please. This is one of the visions that the founder, K.R. Sridhar, our, our CEO, had when, when he started. He really viewed, when, when we talk about the mission, this is about one, one really big piece of our mission is solving energy poverty. So we may be upset because we have a power outage for eight hours and a freezer full of meat thaws out um, and our iPhones don't charge. I think most of where there are parts of the world where they may only have electricity two hours a day or four hours a day or every other day. Um, so we're, we're really, as, as Bloom grows and as we're able to, to expand our mission, this is really the base mission. It is to truly bring what we, are called, what we call islands of hope so that everyone around the world has the same access to resources that we do in the United States. Next slide. Sustainability impact. Um, I know a lot of you are, are interested in, in climate change. There's a lot of benefits to bloom beyond just distributed power. Water is huge. Uh, they talk, no, you know, NOx, SOx, uh, particulates, CO2. You know, th th this is this is an example of, of of why am I so passionate about bloom, being in clean energy and being part of commercializing and scaling a new technology is very rewarding on, on so many different levels. So next slide. Water, um, I'm a huge proponent of water. I grew up on the Mississippi River, as, as I said in the opening. Uh, access to clean water in the end, your body's mostly water. Um, after the fact that Bloom doesn't doesn't have combustion and has no particulates. This is my second, the thing I'm second most passionate about with, with Bloom. Uh, but uh, climate change is real. I, well, let me say, I believe, I, I, should, I should frame those things. I believe climate change is real. And there's so, there so many hard problems to solve. Uh, Bloom is doing you know, just a small part by, by the way the systems use water. Next slide. Uh, you can see our systems are clean enough. I, I don't know how many of you enjoy sitting under uh, transmission lines. I'm not one of those people uh, and eating my lunch. Uh, but you can see here that our systems um, allow, you know, you, you, can, you can stand next to them. You can eat next to them. Next slide. Okay, um, this is a, a slide and, I, and I'll encourage all of you, if, if anyone is interested in more about Bloom, we have, we have a great website. This comes from our website. It's a short video, but I think it's really powerful and impactful. And again, going back to the career story, um, how can you make a difference? Get involved and solve some of, some of these really hard problems. So we can show the video. Today without power is hard to imagine. It's a super resource, a foundational need. In addition to supporting our everyday livelihoods, electricity keeps hospitals running, campuses open, data centers online, supermarkets serving neighbors. Power provides safety during natural disasters, allows us to stay connected locally, globally, and there are a lot of us. 
In this decade alone, the global population has grown by 800 million. Know what else is up? Global carbon emissions. By 1.5 billion tons. That's equivalent to 318 million vehicles driven in one year. More. Power outages tallied to 3,500 in one year. In the U.S. alone. These are big numbers. As the world grows, the demand for energy does too, causing more carbon emissions, climate change, natural disasters, further stressing the aging grid. So, more power outages, costing billions of dollars every year. That's expensive to governments, businesses, and communities. The point? You have to think about power the same way you would think about cybersecurity. Preventing an outage is essential to your business. When it's too late, too late. If the grid can't cope with today, you need a solution for tomorrow. And Bloom Energy has one. Yep, we've designed always-on microgrids that provide clean, resilient, cost-effective energy. This is a big deal. Know what a microgrid is? A localized grid that's always on. A safe haven of power. It's reliable. On-site power, even when the grid is down. It's resilient. Powers through typhoons, hurricanes, blizzards, and more. It's always on. Keeps powering businesses, emergency services, and communities where it matters most. You're smart. You get it. Your business needs reliable power. Heck, the world needs it. Not sometimes, not until there's an outage. Always. Always on power from Bloom Energy. Okay, so thank you for uh, watching that balloon commercial. Okay, next next slide. Yeah, so just go ahead and build this out, Jen. So, so just, in, just in closing, one, if you're stressed over your career, don't be stressed. There, there are so many problems that need to be solved and so many opportunities. And the, and the interesting part of your generation, you know, you're at the beginning of your career, I'm at the end, is you will, there, there are jobs being created every day that don't exist today. So you may find yourself 10 years from now leading a team to do something that didn't even exist as we're talking here today in, in 2020. I would always encourage you to take educated chances and risks. I've taken many, many opportunities, um, some, some big risks, some little risk, <clears throat> but, but I was open to the possibility my strategy, my philosophy is the worst you can do is fail. And if you fail, you just go back to what you were doing before. I've been fortunate not to, not to have to go back and do a do-over. I've always moved forward, but, but I was never afraid of going back. Do something dynamic like Bloom Energy. I mean, you, you don't have to, to come work for Bloom, but there are so many opportunities out there to make a difference in the world. And then finally, have fun and, and, and take this from somebody who's been in the workforce. I started babysitting in 1972. I've been in the workforce a very long time. If you didn't enjoy it, it's just misery. And there's no reason for people who are smart, engaged, and interesting to do things that they don't enjoy. And, and into, you know, I kind of went, I, I'm, I'm, you know, from the hardcore Midwestern generation that work was, was a means to an end. And, and if you had fun at work, there was something wrong with you. I, I love that your generation has embraced uh, you know, work as a work as a as an integrated part of who you are, and that it, that it's okay to uh, to really go out and enjoy what you do for a living. Uh, so that is it from me talking at you. Like I said, the richness is this is me talking to you uh, and with you. So if uh, we're ready for Q and A. Oh yeah, one. I'm glad. I almost missed this slide. Uh, the organization that I founded does give scholarships. So those of you who need them, um, you can go to Southern Automotive Women's Forum and apply um, for our 2021 scholarship. All right, now I'm ready for Q&A. Thank you so much, Susan. That was an amazing presentation and I can't wait to see um, what questions people can, are asking. Um, so Feel free, please ask questions in either the chat box or the Q&A feature, um, and we will try to get to as many as possible. So okay, great. The first one we have for you today is how do we encourage and inspire the next generation of girls to pursue careers in STEM? 
So that is a great question. And actually immediately after this, I'm meeting with a group of eighth graders from Middle Tennessee. I, I try to, uh, a woman I know who is uh, the, the, uh, the chair of the chemistry department there, uh, sponsors an organization called Expanding Your Horizons. So I'll, I'll give you my bias in my experience is that girls make decisions that affect the rest of their life in sixth, seventh and eighth grade. So you as young people are closer to that than I am. So my real passion, and if I could do, if I had like all the money in the world and never had to work again, I would just go get all the middle school girls and get them together in a room and, and just tell them how amazing they are, how wonderful they are, and like put, plant a chip in them. Um, not that they all need to do STEM. I mean, you know, it's kind of gone the other way, like my, cause my daughter um, is going to fashion school. Um, and she tells everybody that her mom made her be on the robotics team. And, and I, I, I get that not, not everyone wants to be in STEM, but if you do want to be in STEM, they're, they're neat. You, you need to have that foundation, not, they already have the brain, their brain already works that way. They need to have the confidence foundation. They need to have that. And, and so I, you know, believe me, me speaking to eighth grade girls is kind of hysterical because like I'm old enough to be their grandma. But, um, you know, I try to convey it to them, but mentor, 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 sixth, seventh and eighth grade girls. Remember what it was like to be an eighth grade girl. Um, I, in a lot of ways, I tell people I was really fortunate when you grow up in a steel town, there are so many people and mostly men who don't want to be working in the steel mill. And if you have any kind of competency at all, and they see any kind of spark and you know, people I went to church with, teachers, they push you out. Um, so I, you know, cause I didn't fit and it actually, I wasn't like bullied or made fun of. It was actually like, well, you're different, but that's a good thing. So we're gonna make sure that you get a good education, go to school. I don't think most middle school girls today find themselves in that situation. I didn't have social media. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm dealing, I have two Gen Z's, so I had children later in life, which I think is in some ways fortunate because it helps me stay tuned in to the workforce. So um, mentor middle school girls, um, once, once people get to high school, um, the chance that they'll go into STEM is less. So it gets less and less and less. So you got a role model all the time at, at all ages. And I tell parents, don't tell kids that math is hard. There's a lot of kids that love math. And if you're a parent and you're telling your kids math is hard or, you know, you know, there's just so many subtle things to do out there. So, um, understand that, that the, um, environment, as you go into the environment, whatever job it is, um, make it, make it better for the women who come after you. So be a role model and, and, and just, and make the, the workplace better and do conferences like this, be the change you wanna see. Yeah, that's some great advice. Um, so kind of going off of that question, um, do you feel like there's more of an equality in the STEM field now than when you started? I think it's different. Um, there, the women who came before me, so my grandmother was born in 1910. When she was born, women weren't, weren't, couldn't even vote, right? She should have been a lawyer or a judge financially and gender, that, that didn't happen. My mom went into the workforce, she was a teacher. My mom got paid less. My dad had died, my, which is why my mom went to work. My mom got paid less because she was a woman. And when she asked for a raise, um, she was told, well, the men are raising a family. Well, so was she. So, I mean, so those kind of things are less blatant, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, there aren't factories, I don't believe today, uh, plastered with Playboy centerfolds, like, you know, every snap, every uh, craftsman toolbox, when you open the top, used to do that. You don't, you don't, you don't see those, there's, there's not that kind of over. Um, I worry now today that it is more covert where in a lot of ways I feel like <clears throat> I had some advantage because I always knew where people stood with me. I mean, men would come up to me and say, I don't wanna work for you because you're a woman. You can actually deal with that, right? You know where that person's coming from. You can have a conversation about it. You can come to a, a place of respect or you can agree to disagree. Um, so I think there's a lot less of the, the kind of, you know, mad men, 1950s sexism 
um, in the workplace. But I still think that there are, are enormous challenges that need to be overcome. And it's harder when you don't know, when they're not in your face. I always tell people, stab me in the front, don't stab me in the back. You don't like me, I don't care. You know, just tell me how you really feel and then we can deal with that. Um, so I think that the new generations are, and the new regulations and the new workplaces are much more civil. Um, but some of those, uh, some of the things that I dealt with very openly, um, I think that you will find in the workplace and they may not be as open and, 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 and I think that that can be a struggle. I'm not, I'm not advocating at all going back to the old world, but I'm advocating dealing with real action, you know, real human traits up front and out front as opposed to underground. Yeah, no, that's um, definitely something that I think, you know, a lot of people still have to face and that's unfortunate, but hopefully going into the future, um, we can create a generation of both men and women who want to work together. That's just, you know, all, all genders, all races, and that's, um, you know, hopefully we can have that equity going forward. So, yeah, and, and, I, and I find it exciting because I do have two Gen Z children. Um, that, yeah, I see, you know, I maybe have to wait for all of us to leave the workforce, but I do think the next generations coming in are, are much more, um, are, are going to be much different. Yeah. Okay. So are there any experiences you had or recommend to us as undergrad students that you can um, use to jumpstart a career in clean energy? Yeah, I think that, that, that that's a great question in that take a variety of classes that really challenge you and make you think differently. So there's the core classes that, that you have to take, right? You know, but really, but really think about what, you know, are you machine learning or um, some kind of, you know, maybe you take design because if you look at the bloom box, it is a very curated product. The design is very intentional. The design is so it could, it could be out in front of any major museum or building. Uh, and and it's, it's almost a piece of art. And, and so there are, there are overlaps um, in classes that you may not, you know, you may be so focused on, I'm going to be a chemical engineer and taking all the really hard chemical engineering classes, but take some creative classes, you know, take some, I always, I've always loved art, you know, back at least when I went to school, and I'm not sure what it's like now, you paid for a certain level and everything else above that was free. So I, and you used to be able to take non-credit classes. Um, so I took non-credit classes in art history and in, in, I love reading and literature and I love history, you know, understand all those, you know, evolve all parts, of, all parts of your brain, especially the parts that you're afraid of and you're afraid you may fail at. Take, take some things, you know, non, you know, believe me, I got a D in art in high school and it impacted how, you know, my, your standing when you graduate. So yeah, art is not my thing, but, but, you know, do those things without them having penalty. Um, don't just join an organization like this, be part of the planning team, have to put on a virtual conference, have to, have to go work with people you, you are very different than, you know, if, you know, go volunteer with a, with an organization that's completely opposite of who you are, but it's, it, it's stretch who you are, but in, in a safe and, uh, in, in, you know, non-penalty way. Yeah, you have to be comfortable with stepping outside your comfort zone when you know that you can take those risks. Like in yeah. college, it's the perfect time to go ahead yeah. and take some of those risks. Exactly. Take risks when it's safe and there's no penalty. Yeah. Um, okay. So our next question is, how did you make the decision to go from research to manufacturing? So what inspired you to take this step if you originally didn't want to be in manufacturing? Okay. So after five years of, um, and, and all the experiments that I did were um, actually very successful, but literally, like, you have, I had a professor who I worked for a PhD, who's like, I want you to use a 250 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. I'm like, 
you don't think I could even pick the glassware to do the experiment with? It's like, oh my God, you know, and then changing the, ex we're going to change this variable a half a degree. And then you run the whole experiment, then you change it. I'm thinking, I am going to lose my mind. So I ended up in Iowa. Um, I was, I've been married twice, or a whole nother story. Um, but um, this job came open, this was way back in the day, the back page of the Des Moines Register, when you got jobs in newspapers. Um, and, you know, I was in a place, I didn't know anybody, I was in a town of 500 people. And um, I thought, well, I got to do something. And I actually had several offers from University of Nebraska Medical School to do what I had done. And this was just a, just a random um, application that I did. I literally got hot, you know, because you mailed stuff in and typed out your resume. Um, you know, I mailed it on Sunday after the paper. Um, they got it Monday and I had the job by, by the next Monday. But you know, when I came in for the interview, it was a stamping plant and there were 200 presses, you know, making noise and forklifts moving around and people moving around. I thought it, it was, it was an energy thing. It just, it's, it's hard to describe, but I felt like, okay, this is not ever what I wanted to do, but this is a kind of energy and motion and activity that I want to be around. And if I try it and I fail, I got seven job offers at University of Nebraska Medical Center. I can go back there, but here I am. Yeah, and going back to what you said before about taking small risks, you know, in undergrad, it's a perfect time to go ahead and get some internships. Those are so much more available now, I'm assuming, than they used to be. So, you know, if you don't know if you're like manufacturing, get a manufacturing internship and just see how exactly. you like it. It's a tri nice little trial run. Um, you will know very quickly whether you like manufacturing yes. or you don't. <laughs> yes, I definitely think so. Okay, so we have a couple more technical questions just about Bloom Energy in general. So um, our one question is, to what extent are fuel cells being integrated into the grid right now and how can they be integrated more? Yeah, so, so that's, that's a great question and this is really an exciting time for Bloom. So the microgrid concept really is an opportunity to allow technologies like Bloom to be integrated with technologies like solar and wind and the grid. So the verticals that Bloom really focuses on right now, and again, you can find more on the website, data centers. So you can just imagine before the pandemic, data centers were growing rapidly. And an edge data center in a city, I'll just use the city of San Jose as an example, the power costs of the data centers that that last mile to boost large amounts of data are very high. So our product is, 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 is very, works out not just financially, but you know, you lose Netflix for an hour and the world goes crazy, right? So, so the, and, and now there are really serious things like online education. So, so data centers are, are, are a huge vertical where we, um, we have our um, systems there. Retail, Home Depots, Walmarts, get hit by a hurricane, you get hit by a tornado. Um, and people need response afterwards. So they wanna be open and be available and be good community, community citizens. And, they, and, and so, so that, kind of, uh, that kind of opportunity. Hospitals, and, and you saw it in the day without power. You know, surgeries, NICUs, there are so many reasons that, that you need a hospital to run. I mean, I don't think that that's like hard, hard to imagine. Um, so, so we, we, we really find ourselves being able to uh, supply them um, and, and, and just kind of a, a host of, we have some utilities that we, we partner with, uh, you know, we, we, there's so much opportunity and, and now we it just made a, two, two pretty big announcements. We're working on hydrogen um, as well as uh, marine. So boats, ships come into ports like Oakland or, or uh, LA and New York and they idle. Um, so we, we really see an opportunity for our servers to, to serve in a, in a very different way, uh, but in a way that not just enables clean transportation, but also enables the community. You know, one of the things we didn't talk a lot about, you know, I didn't talk much about in my presentation, I'm very passionate about jobs and industry. It is really easy to outsource the ugly stuff and send it someplace you can't see. 
that is not the right answer. And that's how the Rust Belt, you know, again, this is my opinion, that's how the Rust Belt happened. We outsource things rather than try to, to fix what we, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? The problem you're trying to solve is how do you have something like X manufacturing plant or X port and people live by those things, right? So how, how do you have how do you have both of the, the community and the and the jobs? And so those are some great problems, and that's why I'm really proud to work at Bloom because I see Bloom as an excellent solution for the community and the jobs to coexist. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so I have one final question for you here today. So, do you have any advice for gaining confidence and making your voice heard as a woman in the clean energy field oh my god that is like that is the quintessential 21st century question um so i i um i'm i'm i guess i'm an extrovert i don't know i never never did the the survey or whatever, me too me too <laughs> you have to you have to have the courage you have to have the moxie you have to be in the fight and there's no, there's no, I would love to, to say this in a very elegant, pretty way, but I don't, I, I don't have an elegant, pretty, pretty answer. And in my career, you have to put it out. You have to be out there. You have to be bold. You have to state your position. If you're in a room and you're the only woman in the room and you say something and then a man repeats it and all of a sudden it gets attributed to him, you need to say immediately, thank you very much for repeating my, my solution or my, or my, you know, my, my commentary, thank you for agreeing that it's really the right way to go and, and, and get, get, get the voice back. It's really easy to lose your voice and, and you have to fight to, to have a voice. Um, and, you know, you have to work harder and it's just, it is kind of what it is. I'm hoping it won't always be what it is, but, but I do, I do believe that, that, that is a, that is the key to success is, and I've tell this to many women who work for me, there are many women that'll be sitting at a table and something will happen and they won't say anything. And, and I'll either text them in a meeting or after the meeting say, you know, it's not just one thing to get to the table, you gotta be the voice at the table. And sometimes you, you have to, to fight for your, your voice, but you gotta fight yourself first. Don't look at it as an external thing. It's, a, it's about you having the confidence to project your voice. You already know what you're talking about. Get it out there. It's not easy. Yeah, that's some wonderful advice. And um, thank you again so much for taking time out of your day to come and talk to us. So again, if anybody has any additional questions for Susan, we will be giving out her contact information. So feel free to follow up with her um, or follow up with any of our panel sessions from earlier this week. So again, we're so thankful for all of you for to, I'm sorry, we're all, we're so thankful for <laughs> all of you to attend today's session. Um, and we really hope that you enjoyed it. So just as a reminder, we have one more final panel session this afternoon about navigating the post-grad world and then finding your vocation in the clean energy space. And this is, that's immediately right after this from uh, 12 to 1 PM. So we highly encourage you to attend that one as well. At the conclusion of this presentation, you'll be asked to fill out a survey. So please give us your feedback um, on how you enjoyed this session. And then again, the follow-up materials will also be included, um, will be presentations, contact information, and for both the speakers and the conference planning team. Also, we have some companies that are interested in recruiting after this event. So one, for example, is ICF, an international consulting firm with divisions across the clean energy and climate change space and they'll be recruiting for positions in their energy environment and infrastructure groups so you'll receive a follow-up email with conference materials as well as a list of available positions with the company and contacts you can uh, reach out to to discuss open positions so again thank you so much for coming today and enjoy the rest of your day thank you sophie thank you so much susan yes yeah, sorry oh you're fine <laughs> I appreciate the time. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Thank you.